I am honored to give the floor to our speaker today, Ambassador Philip Murphy. Wow. Good morning, everybody. I better not let you down. Madam President, esteemed members of the Board of Trustees, in particular my 30-plus year friend Kevin Kennedy, distinguished members of the faculty and staff, fellow honorary doctoral recipients, the extraordinary academic Phil Lewis, the gripping author Camila Shamsi, who we heard from so movingly yesterday, and Bill Black Sox Harley. I'm honored to be among you. Family and friends, and most importantly, members of the Hamilton College graduating class of 2015. I cannot tell you how honored I am to be among you. I'm a huge admirer of Hamilton College, and this is a day I will not forget, nor will you, I suspect. A friend reminded me recently that a commencement speaker's role is the same as the role played by the corpse in an Irish wake. It's to get the party started. <laughs> so let's get going. <clears throat> I am, uh, I have to say parenthetically, this is my first visit ever to this esteemed college. I'm so impressed and someone told me today that the weather is always like it is this weekend. <laughs> so I'll, I'll be back in January for a visit. I have to acknowledge before going further how rocking the name Hamilton has become everywhere from this great institution all the way to Broadway. And by the way, in both places, it's hard to get in, but once you do get in, apparently it changes your life. Alexander Hamilton spent much of his distinguished life in New York, right here. I've been thinking a lot of late about another public figure who served New York, Robert Kennedy, no relation to Kevin. He represented the Empire State of the United States Senate from 1965 until his death in 1968. And my musings about him are really not political, although I have much sympathy for what he stood for. I'm drawn to him for two other in my opinion, compelling reasons, each of which has enormous relevance today. One was his ability to connect with people of all shapes and sizes, even in some cases in desperate circumstances. And two, his unwavering belief in the power of the individual to change the world from the bottom up. We grew up middle class on a good day in greater Boston. By the way, are there any citizens here today of the Red Sox Nation? Just checking. Maybe someday we'll win another game. From the middle class, again barely, we chuckled at the fact that we held out Bobby Kennedy and his brothers as our middle class heroes, even though none of them spent one minute of their own personal lives living in the middle class. But forget about the Murphys. Look at how he bonded with the likes of Cesar Chavez and the migrant workers in California, or the coal miners and their families in Eastern Kentucky. On the outside, they didn't seem to have anything in common whatsoever with him. But as Reverend King famously reminded us almost 52 years ago, it is not the color of your skin, or if I may expand, the God you worship, or the thing you wear on your head, or your last name, or your gender, or your preference, or your accent, or anything. It is the content of your character on the inside that counts. And graduates, given the world that is awaiting you, that is a powerful lesson. If none of you have studied it, please search, not now please, please search for Bobby Kennedy, Indianapolis, April 4th, 1968. He was running for president. Before Kennedy boarded the plane, he was told that Martin Luther King Jr. had been shot. 
When he landed, King was dead. The schedule in Indianapolis called for a large ra rally downtown in the city's African-American neighborhood. The mayor, Richard Lugar, later a giant in the U.S. Senate and one of the most passionate supporters of student exchange programs in the last half century, told Kennedy's staff that he could not provide security as riots were breaking out all across the country. Kennedy went ahead with no security. And as it was the pre-information age, he is the one who broke the news of King's death to the thousands who had gathered. And for the first time in his life, he referred to his brother's murder, also at the hands of a white man. And by doing so, he instantly bonded with the African-American crowd. He pulled out his worn copy of The Greek Way by Edith Hamilton, apparently no relation to Alexander Hamilton, and read from a favorite poem by Aeschylus that had been recommended to him by his brother's widow, Jacqueline. Even in our sleep, pain which cannot forget falls drop by drop upon the heart until in our own despair, against our will, comes wisdom through the awful grace of God. There was rioting all across urban America that night, but not in Indianapolis. Now, for those of you who get nervous about giving a speech, which I don't, or have writer's block, which I do, file this notion. That speech was written inside of 10 minutes and is considered one of the greatest speeches in American the past century in America. Thankfully, our country today is not torn apart by war and murder, including Bobby Kennedy's own death two months after King's, as it was in 1968, even though I admit to you some days it seems like it is. But the world awaiting you is fractured almost like never before. It is filled with chasms, voids, disagreements, and conflicts. The words common and ground have become oxymoronic. Shia Sunni, China, Japan, Greece, Germany, Israelis, Palestinians, our Congress, our political discourse, our economic divisions, immigration, blacks, whites, the technology wedge, and on and on and on. Now, while there are always nuances and exceptions, the world that we largely collectively graduated into was defined largely by ginormous plates that constantly rubbed and occasionally collided. Communism and capitalism, war and anti-war, oppression and civil rights. Now, that's not to say that all these struggles are behind us. And should you need any evidence that racism is alive and well in America, check out some of the responses to President Obama's Twitter post from this week. But the world into which you are graduating is not defined, for the most part, by neat divisions. But it lies in a million little pieces. Our generation has either created many of the fractures or at a minimum, has failed to mend them. The challenge of your generation is akin to piecing together a giant jigsaw puzzle that somebody has dropped out of the box onto the floor. The voids need to be filled. The dissent brooked, but compromise achieved. The fractures mended. The common ground found. There is no question it can be done. There is also no question that the world will continue to change. President Kennedy said change is the law of life. The questions are, what is the path to a better place? Who will lead us there? And how will you all fit in? I mentioned Robert Kennedy's belief in the power of the individual to ignite change. He spoke it 
Cape Town University in the teeth of South Africa's apartheid in 1966, it said something that I think humbly, if I may, you should remember, and I quote him. Each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Pretty powerful. For all the time and energy we focus on top-down leadership from presidents to popes, history will tell you that the most profound and lasting change comes from individuals, from the streets. Rosa Parks wasn't an elected official when she stood her ground on the bus in Montgomery on December 1st, 1955. The East Germans who gathered on October 9th, 1989 in Leipzig had no idea that 70,000 would march that evening. The fruit vendor in Sidi Bujid, Tunisia, who took his own life on December 7, 2010, out of frustration with the authorities, never expected that he would set a new course in the Arab world. And by the way, most of history's change agents don't get their own chapters in the history books. And so while your world today is very different from our world then, the power of the individual to change the world is undiminished. If you accept the double-headed premise that the world is in pieces and the strength of the individual rages on, there are leadership opportunities for your class and your generation as never before. They are almost endless. So after you celebrate this weekend, and I hope you do, instead of shrinking from a world in crisis, pulling the covers up and staying in bed, view this moment in history and your ability to shape a better outcome as the chance of a lifetime. And I implore you to rise up. And if the challenge is reconstituting what has become an atomized world, I suggest you start leading in practical, local, and tangible ways. I would personally focus less at your age on battling high-flying ideology and far more on walking in the other guy's shoes. And remember, always remember, most big movements start small before they get big, and most great leaders start as nobodies who turn into somebodies. So I recommend you start with some life decisions that are completely within your control. Take some situational risk and try about try thinking or doing one or more of the following. How about living in a neighborhood or a town with people who don't look like you? If you go to church, how about visiting a mosque this quarter and a temple next quarter or vice versa? If you're a liberal, watch Fox News once a week. <laughs> I know, I know. If you're a conservative, try MSNBC once a week. Ask yourselves, what is your workplace like? What activities do you pursue? Can you find a way early in your adult years to live internationally? How about this? Consider serving your country, either in the military or the diplomatic corps. And there are other questions that I encourage you to think about in the same family. One of the biggest mistakes I made in life was hanging around too many people for too long who were too much like me. If your life revolves around the same old posse, you're going to have a hard time leading the change that we need. Always be safe, but don't be timid. Take some risk. You also have a challenge that we didn't have, and that is technology. It can be your biggest ally and your most potent enemy. Your access and reach and connectivity dwarf 
what came before. But beware the void that technology has created. How many times have we all been in a car or on a bus or in a room where there's no conversation at all? The world around us is beginning to remind me of the New York Yankees in the late 1970s. After the game, 25 guys, 25 taxis. Be clear-eyed about when technology is your friend and when it is your foe. Force yourself to interact human to human. Pick up the phone. Pay a visit. Are you ready for this one? Write a handwritten letter. I know, I know. As my mother in heaven is also applauding. As the famous journalist Edward R. Murrow said, and I quote him, the real crucial link in the international exchange is the last three feet, which is bridged by personal contact, one person talking to another. I will update Murrow's plea to the 21st century. If you are to seize the great opportunity before you to mend our, our world, know when to put the machine down and pick the man up. In, I was about to say, I'm, I gotta keep moving here because I'm the last guy standing between you and the bar, but I realize it's between you and your degrees, so. In whatever way you choose to lead, keep King and Gandhi before him as your North Stars. March relentlessly toward finding common ground, committed always to understanding the inside the character of others, including your foes, and two, to standing no matter how great the pressure for peaceful change, just as they did. But in all of our lives, from time to time, in ways big and small, we are presented with moments of truth. And once every couple or few generations, as a nation or as a society com with common values, we run out of diplomatic options. The pursuit of common ground is exhausted, and the stakes are just too high to walk away. If your generation is presented with such a moment, and please God, you're, you're not, may you have the individual and collective wisdom and courage to differentiate a shades of gray dilemma from one which is black and white, and that's typically good versus evil. When you finish, if I may ask you this favor, searching for the events of April 4th, 1968 in Indianapolis, I'd ask you to study a man named Dietrich Bonhoeffer. If you understand his life, you will be better women and men and better leaders. Bonhoeffer was a German Christian minister who embraced a life of God and peace but increasingly became an outspoken critic of Adolf Hitler and National Socialism. He studied for a while in New York City and was greatly influenced by his time at the Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, where he became a student of social justice. He returned to a Germany falling toward an abyss. He became a vocal critic not only of Hitler, but of Christian leaders who were doing too little, if anything at all, to stand up for Jews and a whole range of minorities. Bonhoeffer became more and more strident and more, out, and more public in his outcry against the Nazis and their epic persecutions. With others, he was involved ultimately in an unsuccessful plot to kill Hitler. Bonhoeffer was arrested in April of 1943 and he was hanged in the Flossenburg concentration camp in April of 1945, literally just days before the Allies liberated it. So please remember the lessons of Bonhoeffer and of the greatest generation of Americans from that same era, some of whom are here today. Here's to you folks. And what are those lessons? No one to compromise. Know when to pursue diplomacy at all costs.
but also know when to stand your ground. A great American once said, and I quote him, if your opponent has a conscience, then follow Gandhi. But if your enemy has no conscience, like Hitler, then follow Bonhoeffer. And that American was Martin Luther King, Jr. Hamilton graduates, you are at the front edge of what could be the most consequential decade of your lives. Some of you will make your marks before you turn 30. Many of you will take longer to flower. Both roads are fine, as are all the roads in between. And just as Leo Messi is 27, and my friend G. Easy turns 26 today, and Paul McCartney was 27 when the Beatles broke up, and Reverend King was 26 when he took on his leadership role in Montgomery. So is it also the fact that Ronald Reagan and Nelson Mandela were 69 and 75, respectively, when they became president. And Pope Francis is 78 today. And Harper Lee's next book is coming out in July. And she's 89. <laughs> here, here. While it is true that you have all taken this four-year journey together and you have so much in common as a result, it is also true that you will each follow your own distinct path from here on out. And that is what is meant to be. Now, you are only one young once, so enjoy the ride. But please also be careful. You feel a certain invi invincibility in your 20s and early 30s. It's human nature. You convince yourself that you can run 100 miles an hour all the time and not pay any price. You come to believe that while life is a marathon, it needs to be run at sprint speed. So please, don't make so many of the mistakes that so many of us made in our early adult years. Watch your health. This, by the way, your parents have asked me to say this. Watch your health. Tend to your friendships and make time for your families, particularly for your parents and grandparents, who too many of us think in the same category as a, like a vacation rental that we'll get to when we have more time. And I'm here to tell you that they're not always there when you have the time. So take that time now. I, That was a complete sop to get the parents and grandparents to applaud me. <laughs> I leave you with a prediction. You may think on this last day at Hamilton that your bouts of immaturity and spasms of boneheaded behavior have run their course. <laughs> and that you have embarrassed yourselves in countless ways, but you have also fulfilled your quota and that you are now entering the mature phase of life. You are wrong. <laughs> I am here to tell you that many boneheaded moments are awaiting you. <laughs> you will stun yourself by how stupid you continue to be as adults. <laughs> to, it's true. I don't want you to think I'm getting emotional up here, by the way. To wit, and to give you a taste of what lies ahead of you, I present to you actual bonehead moments from my adult years. You look wonderful. When is the baby due? <laughs> this is a true story. I had the baby. She's five years old. <laughs> Ouch. Jeff, you were great to bring your mother to our cookout. Actually, Phil, this is Martha, my wife. I am pretty good at foreign languages. I got very good at German, but I have this nasty darn problem of mixing words up. So again, I was the sitting United States ambassador and spent a week introducing my father-in-law. Where's Tammy? You hear Tammy somewhere? My wife is here, her dad. Uh, anyone here, German speakers, raise your hand. Anybody? A Couple of shy hands go up. So the, the, um, the word for in-law is Schwieger and the word for pregnant is schwanger. 
So I was introducing people. This is my Schwanga Vater, Ed Snyder, <laughs> for about a week until uh, one of my Foreign Service colleagues pulled me aside and had the gumption to tell me that even though my father-in-law is a little bit hefty, that's not the right. I, I made a similar mistake, uh, and I won't, I won't uh, connect the dots on this one, but you can imagine a similar mistake in Italian with a group of distinguished Italian folks where I was introducing again Tammy's parents, and I was saying the word for parent is genitori, and I spent a whole evening uh, introducing them as Tammy's genitale. So I will... Uh... <laughs> so please, keep this in the back of your minds. You know the... Uh... The, uh, the TV commercial for Hotels.com where the naked guy gets locked out of his hotel room? Kevin and I have a dear friend who pushed the room service tray out in the hall. He caught his hand on it, he went with it, and the door slammed behind him. No clothes on. Rich found no potted plant for protection and spent some rather chilly moments in the halls of a London hotel looking for help. He, he now eats religiously in hotel restaurants. And one more for you. Between the funeral mass for a family friend and the interment, members of my family, this is a true story, got confused at a traffic light and they unknowingly followed the wrong funeral procession, ending up at a graveside service attended by total strangers praying over someone they had never met before. However, the loved ones of the deceased were quite moved that my family made such an effort. So trust me, catalog your own boneheaded moments because they will come to you because you might be up here someday, all right? And so I conclude, may your adult years be filled with a richness of diversity and good judgment, that you stay healthy and happy, and that you make time for those dear to you, that all your dreams come true, but if they don't, then celebrate the ones that do, that you lead and always find the common ground, vigorously filling those voids and putting that grand puzzle back together. That you never forget the lessons of King and Gandhi on the one hand and Bonhoeffer on the other, and that you always know the difference and act accordingly. And if it comes to it, may you answer the call and become the generation by which history will then measure greatness. May you be so lucky and curious as to carry your own book of Greek poetry, just in case. And may you always retain in life some of the innocent, lovable, unabashed, bonehead Hamilton College kid that you are today. The world is awaiting you. If I go on any longer, I will evoke Frank Sinatra, who used to say, may you all live to 100 and may the last voice you hear be mine. <laughs> I would rather channel today Wiz Khalifa, who would want us to chant, we're going to party all night, no sleep. Thank you very much.